Yo, what is up guys? Snap here. Today we're going to be doing all of the party builds that we're going to be playing in the 322 Trial of the Ancestors expansion. This one's going to be a little long. There's actually, ironically, quite a lot of changes to a lot of the party builds here, even though the patch notes might have not had a ton of balance changes, made a lot of adjustments, made a lot of optimizations, and mainly the choice of content that we're doing has required some shifts in a little bit of our team comp here that we're going to be running in the six man. So I'm also going to be splitting out the Atlas strategy portion that I usually do in this particular video into a different video. So if you're looking for that, there's going to be another video for it. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. Our choice of carry is going to be Spark, of course. I don't know what you expected. Spark is just head and shoulders above literally any other spell at the moment. The only thing that really might come close to it is Vol BV while you're abusing the Soul Gain Prevention Sextant. And there's an argument that that isn't really even necessary. And losing the Sextant in the current juicing meta probably is not so great. So it's going to be Spark. Now, if you might notice, we are playing Spark on two different ascendancies, which is a Deadeye or a Trickster. And the reason for that is we have the plan on playing one of the two carries based off of how good or bad the Tormented Spirit rework is for Ghosts for juicing. TLDR is if Ghosts are good, we're going to be playing a fast movement speed pathfinder and then a minor support if ghosts end up being bad and in either case we have the option to play a trickster sparker or a dead eye sparker with whichever one we want to do so we're planning for contingencies here which is a very good practice when you're playing in a group so you always have some sort of fallback plan that you can go to if your plans don't really work out how you think they will so first things first for the spark carry this is going to be very similar to the trickster carry with some minor variations and i'll point them out as we go along here this particular sparking tree is nothing new it is very similar to what we've run in previous leagues but we have tried to incorporate some new things here main addition here is we have decided to put in this impossible escape at necromantic aegis in the end game tree this picks up a lot of skill duration gives you some es which is helpful for your ehp it helps reduce the mana cost because we are no longer planning on using vol clarity in soul gain prevention maps so you do need to do a little bit more than previously necessary to get your spark mana cost under control. Additionally, Ash, Frost, and Storm is a pretty good percent ink damage. It also has effect of non-damaging ailments, which one, helps cap out your brittle, and two, helps cap out your scorch. Overall, it's a very slot efficient thing. We previously had an impossible escape over here, but since we're starting on Ranger, you can just kind of path over there anyways, which brings us to the new addition here, which is the addition of a green nightmare. If you didn't see my trial of the Ancestors preview, essentially there is a tattoo, which will convert dexterity to cold res, and in turn, you'll be able to use that cold res to get spell suppression at 70% of the value. Now, the value we saw was eight resistance, which translates to five spell suppression. So each dex node you can convert here with tattoos is giving you eight cold res and then also five spell suppression. Additionally, the jewel itself is giving you eight cold as chaos, which synergizes super well with the call of the brotherhood conversion chain, giving you extra chaos damage. It's super nice, well worth the jewel slot. It helps you get res capped, which is kind of hard on this build. And also suppression is a welcome addition. We're sitting at 96% spell suppression cap on the carry. That's of course using the Lucky Mastery. It's a little bit too hard to get suppression caps, so I think you just sit at like, you know, 80% actual spell suppression, get the Lucky Mastery, and overall, I think it's the best move for the point efficiency here. Additionally, you path by the two Strength and Int nodes here in case you need to put a tattoo for plus one all Lightning Gems. We'll probably also see equally strong nodes on the Strength notable here, so there's some other things to note here that is important about the build. You, of course, need to be taking the Elemental Mastery. This helps you get Reflect Immune. This, combined with the Pantheon, gives you Reflected Elemental Damage Immunity. This increases the total pool of map mods that you can run, so you definitely want to go out of your way to grab this. Additionally, we are taking a Militant Faith just for this keystone, pretty much. This might not seem super point efficient at first. However, the reason you're taking this and converting all of your Frenzy Charges just to Power Charges is the Altar mods for Frenzy Charges and Endurance Charges fucking destroy you when you click it on the Altar. And so just having to worry about the Power Charge one, which as you can see here is just losing a bit of Crit Multi, isn't that really big of a deal. You just lose some damage. It's all right, your damage is overkill anyways, whereas this reduced recovery rate can actually just straight up kill you. Not to mention the insane penalty of 50% reduced defenses per frenzy charge. So the goal of this keystone is to just simply get rid of the frenzy charges while also giving you some damage back in return. So overall, it's super efficient. Definitely get the Milton Faith. Some standard stuff, eye to eye repeater cluster jewels here. You have Secrets of Suffering combined with Southbound Gloves so to enable the culling setup. But yeah, it is kind of just another spark tree. The Ascendancy knows it does get gives you an extra chain and two additional additional projectiles for free. And when you're trying to break into content, like doing five orb deli super early, uh, it is super nice to have that extra projectiles, extra damage, extra chain. It is super good. Anyways, next up, let's take a look at the trickster version of that build. You will see striking similarities between these two builds. And that is because there's literally one change. You're pathing from here and taking the green nightmare 
versus pathing from here. And of course the ascendancy points change. But really besides that, there's not much to change on this character. One thing is you are dropping the chaining range stuff here because you do not have the chain on the ascendancy. So that is one thing you are missing. Make sure to unspec that because it doesn't do anything. You also are taking more masteries here for polymath. The tracer gets some really good shit. Polymath is a lot of damage. It gets the one step ahead for the action speed, which is a little bit worse than tailwind, but it's still pretty good. Escape artist for some more EHP and then also ES overleach is a super good defensive layer on this character. You do also save a skill point by the way here, not having to take this one point wonder for spell leech. Other than that, those two builds are exactly the same. One thing to mention here on the gem links is that we did sub in pierce because we thought we had too many pierces and we subbed it in for peacock. It solves our charge generation problem and while we could probably generate the charges in other ways, just having the peacock and links really kind of helps ease that burden. It's super easy to set up and dropping the pierce for peacock here is definitely something we're going to be doing. The other thing is make sure you're trying to fit in all of this utility. You might try and ignore stuff like sigil of power, but jamming in all this utility like sigil of power and also the vol of righteous fire really increases your burst damage when you need it. So don't think you can forego that extra bit of utility. It really does help when stuff like Costa spawns in the map. You can really just blow it up. Yeah, that is the most interesting bits and pieces about the carry here. Anyways, let's move on to the Aurobot. Now, the most burning question for Aurobot players here is Guardian or Scion. And unfortunately, I think the answer is still Scion. And the even more unfortunate part here is we still don't even know what the fuck the two Guardian Ascendancy nodes do. But even then, I think giving up Scion attack and Caspi is going to be too big. I don't expect you to get a comparable amount of damage that you had before on Guardian here on the new nodes. And so I think the damage loss for not going Scion Orbot is a little bit too big, although the recovery rate on Guardian is truly insane. Anyway, so what changed from 321 to 322? If you are unfamiliar with this particular Orobot, the main feature is that it goes all the way around the tree and it goes through the Marauder socket here and it goes all the way down to Champion of the Cause. This is slightly less point efficient than just getting a Voices. However, you can set it up earlier. It also has two distinct benefits. One of them is that you travel to the Marauder socket. Aura effect Marauder socket jewels are extremely low demand and getting an Aura effect jewel here in this particular socket can lower the cost of your Timeless jewel by five or even 10 divines. That's the first main appeal and the second one is being introduced now with the new 322 mechanic, which is Tattoos of Court. This particular build has a lot more travel nodes, which has a lot more opportunity to abuse tattoos in various interesting ways. So once again, I'm highly recommending the over the tree pathing here that goes all the way the fuck around. It's super cheap. It's super easy to set up. And to me, the number one reason to do this is cost. The tattoos that are immediately interesting on the Orobot is of course the one that we saw, which was reservation efficiency. Now, of course you can replace all of these garbage attribute nodes with tattoos tattoos that give you efficiency, but we just really have no idea the rarity of this and the cost. There are a ton of ways to get extra efficiency on the Orobot already via higher level Enlighten or better cluster jewels with 35 effect, or you can get better voices and condense your cluster jewels. You can get corruptions on stuff like Intuitive Leap. There is just a lot of ways you can do it, and it's usually going to be priced in maybe like the 510 div range. And if the tattoos are giving you something like 1% efficiency and it's costing you like two, three divs, we don't know the price. It might not be worth getting the tattoos. So I'm planning on not putting the Aurobot stats contingent upon being able to get any of the tattoos. One of the big changes here that is going to be hard to incorporate into the build is the introduction of the Forbidden Flesh. I have always historically ignored Forbidden Flesh and Flame. At the time when I need them, they're always just a little bit too pricey because the first ones that are going up, the guys always price them for like 10 or 20 divines or something ridiculous. And the Guardian PDR or the extra 15 or whatever aura effect you get on Champion just wasn't really worth the cost because you didn't really need it anyways unless you're just trying to push spreadsheet number. But now there's a big argument to squeeze in Guardian on your third ascendancy here because because of their recovery rate. Scion does get 3% recovery rate here instead of PDR, which is honestly really massive and is probably gonna be a huge tool in keeping people alive in five orb T16s without the soul gain prevention sextant. Being able to like double the effectiveness of your vitality and also your vault discipline and that kind of thing is invaluable as a survivability tool. I put these in a few of the POBs here, which has allies have 125% increased recovery rate of life, mana, and energy shield. So on this particular end game variant of Scion, I'm sitting at 1700 ES per second. That is purely just from vitality multiplied by the recovery rate, which is actually kind of crazy. This also puts your recharge rate, which is basically Vault Discipline at 8,500 per second, which is just massive. There are also ways to further increase your regen, stuff like Consecrated Ground from Zealotry or Bottled Faith if you have, if other people can jam in Reju Totem, and also if you're using Holy Relic, which brings us to the new change on Scion, which is going to be the Guardian's Blessing. If you haven't watched my previous video on Guardian's Blessing, I would give it a quick watch. It's just a 
couple minutes long that explains kind of the new technology with Guardian's Blessing, but essentially it's not necessary anymore to fit in Divergent Inspiration and a Mana Flask Craft suffix, as well as Mana Cost Reduction on the tree, such as Dreamer. Now you can really put it on a Summon Holy Relic with Divine Blessing and Zealotry and a 3-Link, and it should stay alive to everything, giving you a really nice quality of life aura that is just never going to die, unless you're in some really crazy bossing encounters. And even if it does die, this minion is extremely easy to resummon, which is kind of the main benefit here. This Holy Relic is currently sitting at 14k HP. It has all of the overcap from my auras. It has 20% Chaos Res, it has 6,000 ES for some reason, and it's regenerating 2,300 life per second. This thing is really not going to die unless it gets hit by something really stupid like a Maven Slam or some crazy box DD. So I would rely that this is going to be up almost 100% of the time. And by extension, that means that your blessing is also going to have 100% uptime as well. As for the end game itemization here, it is using just all of the Orobot uniques that you've seen over and over again. Matua Tapuna, Mask of the Tribunal with Aura Effect, Vol Caress, Bubonic with Jinx Juju. These are all mandatory. In order to fit in all the efficiency, I do have to get a life reservation efficiency ring, just one. Those are kind of like the main changes from 321 to 322 of the Orobot. The introduction of the blessing is massive you can use tattoos if they're available but maybe have some fallback plan in case they're a little bit too expensive or too pricey than what you're expecting one other change i should mention here is that we're dropping soul ripper for soul catcher 10 percent soul gain prevention multiplied by 1.7 with the enkindling orb is pretty massive here for vol disc uptime not to mention vms and vol haste uptime and because you can't gain mana it's extra important to get minus mana costs on both of your rings to make sure that you can cast everything but yeah that should be most of the changes for the Orbot here. We're going to move on to the Curse Bot because there's a few changes to that as well. There is one massive change to the Curse Bot that we did this patch, okay? And that is the introduction of changing this Cluster Jewel to Doedre's Apathy. Because the Guardian no longer gets Unnerve and Intimidate for free, you have to get it somewhere. Um, and this one just gives you Unnerve because we're using a spell. And it's just replaced one of the triple small Curse Effect Cluster Jewels that we've got here. We just replace it with a Notable. It gets the Unnerve. It's 10% more damage. It's worth jamming in. Other than that, the Curse Bot, unfortunately, didn't receive any new technical innovations from 321 to 322. I would still highly recommend the Anathema with the Cursing Vixen setup and then putting defensive auras with your main Ellie weakness in the Dialas. It works out super well. There's not much more to say about it. Let us move on to the Mana Guardian here. There is actually a few changes here to talk about. First one is we have a little bit of new pathing here. We used to go down here to get Conduit because we kind of wanted to get the Frenzy and Endurance Charges. But with the Altar Mods kind of fucking you really hard, we decided to just drop Frenzy and Endurance Charges altogether. Therefore, we don't need to path down here so we can get a little bit more efficient pathing to mana if we go to the left down here. Additionally, we're taking an extra Link Cluster here with the Mastery to make your movement speed equal to the highest movement speed among Linked players. If we do have the Fast Boy Ghostbuster in the party, he will instantly get that 1100% movement speed, which could be a good thing to help him loot or it could be a bad thing because your mana guardian's running off and getting everybody killed just have to wait and see if you can control your character with this it might be a bit much we'll just have to see the other big thing here is we are introducing the censure of benevolence here which is a really good fit on the mana guardian we used to put two different belt slots here one of them being the harbinger belt which gives everybody the like tailwind action speed thing it's still quite a good choice, but there's maybe a little bit more of a defensive choice that you could take, which is this belt. Essentially, you could take a bunch of non-unique utility flasks, being the triple Ellie flasks, also a quartz flask, which will give everybody phasing and suppression. And then additionally, you can give everybody onslaught, which Guardian unironically lost on the tree. Used to give everybody onslaught on the ascendancy, and now that this is deleted, there's not a great way to get onslaught to everybody on the party, except for the belt gives it back to everybody via a flask. So it does make sense here, and I think the EHP increase from all the Ellie flasks can maybe save some deaths. Overall, I think it's a pretty good belt to put on now and something we'll probably be using in the future. One other change here is we used to be using a Blight Well because we had the Soul Gain Prevention section on, but if you do not have the Soul Gain Prevention section, of course you just put on a Foible because it's the next best thing for mana. Additionally, the pathing out of here that goes into an Elegant Hubris, just try to get mana on one or maybe two of these. You can even get it on a two-pointer, like down here if you wanted to, to get 30%. Just, just kind of looking for two on this Elegant Hubris. Other than that, the tree is pretty optimized. This is sitting at 16k. There's some really crazy mana guardians you can see that get up to like 20, 30k, but this is probably going to be your entry level thing that you're going to be mapping with without getting into two crazy budgets. Anyways, let us move on to the Kohler here. There is one interesting thing to talk about here, and that is whether or not to coal or not to coal. You might have seen a lot of other people that weren't running Kohler setups in the 321 expansion, and the main appeal of not running a Kohler is you can just put on a Headhunter on a Vengeant Cascade carry, and then because 
because Delirium doesn't affect strongbox monsters within Rage, you don't actually need to be running high Delirium if the majority of your loot is coming out of boxes. Therefore, you could drop the Delhi level a little bit to maybe a Mirror or even one Orb and then just run through the map with a Headhunter and your clear speed was increasing because of it because you didn't have to drag along a color. There was another style of mapping, which was running five Orbs on an Elder map and re-rolling for plus two Abyss projectile. However, these people still probably weren't running a color. And the main reason for that is because once you get to a certain level of gearing, you can have a carry that's running something like ethereal knives, and then they can actually clear the map in a five orb with enough support if your gear is good enough. However, I'd argue that early on and breaking into the content, those kind of budgets just simply aren't viable. And therefore bringing in a Kohler, especially the first week of the league where your gear maybe isn't so great, is still a good idea. I think eventually the argument is to drop a Kohler if you have an unlimited budget and you can gear a carry to the point where it's not necessary. However, being able to bring a Kohler into a map and have basically infinite damage through a proper six man carry at the expense of a slightly slower clear speed, I think is worth it. So TLDR is you probably run a Kohler if you're breaking into the content super early with like five orbs and stuff like that. But eventually when you get enough gear, you could probably drop a Kohler and run a proper MF carry with like EK or even KB, depending on what kind of content you're doing. However, if we ever see the day's return of just maximum giga juicing and returns on rarity, the Kohler will be unbeaten because of its ability to just stack rarity jewels like none other because it doesn't care about any other stat. And so in that situation, you might see Kohlers still having a place in the MFing meta. Regardless, we're still running a color, so let's talk about some of the changes that we've made since the 321 patch. One of the main changes here is that I've introduced a green nightmare pathing to the tree. You can put it in this ranger socket, and once again, it helps you get a ton of cold res as well it helps you suppress cap. This saves a ton of points on the color, which was already super point starved, and this green nightmare tech has really allowed us to drop a lot of points that was going up into mage bane and put a lot more into some survivability and an extra rarity jewel. I do think excess sustenance is like one of the most OP recovery nodes in the game. Definitely try and take this. It is very noticeable when this procs. One other thing here from the Pathfinder rework, we didn't actually play in the Crucible League, but now the Kohler has Master Surgeon, which makes it so his distillate does not turn off, which is a massive buff to his EHP. Because before he had to be ping-ponging between like 50 and maybe 70 or 80% of his life to keep distillate up, but now he can just have his distillate fill his entire life bar with Master Surgeon, giving the Kohler a pretty big substantial amount to, to his uh, EHP there. Additionally, with the deletion of the Chaos Res wheel that was here before, we did have to add an anti-venom here to get the character Chaos capped or close to it. If you read the patch, you'll probably be familiar with the new Corpse Destruction gem that was teased. And unfortunately, I don't think it's worth the gem link. I think you're still going to have to path down here to get the enemies killed by your hits are destroyed. One other thing we introduced here is a Mark on Hit Sniper's Mark. Now, one thing to know about Mark on Hit is it interacts a little bit strangely with curse spots in that it will not override a curse that is applied by a curse spot. And it will also count towards the curse bot's limit when he's applying a new one. And that means the Kohler can Mark on Hit a bunch of rares and stuff that the curse bot probably isn't marking manually. And if the curse bot does need to apply a bigger mark, he can. But it's just a little bit something extra that you can probably jam in here to get extra damage on all just the random rares that are spawning in the map. So it's definitely something you should try to put in here on the color that we didn't have in the past. Other than that, this build is super straightforward. It's just abusing pet blood to stay alive here. You're having trouble keeping the color alive with the pet blood. You can consider putting in an immutable force and a blood notch into this build. However, you will lose rarity and both of those jewels probably are going to cost a little bit. So if you really want to just value survivability over everything, consider blood notch and immutable force in these two sockets here. But I believe with all of the new mana guardian armor buffs that it's getting from having mana convert to armor and instead of life. I don't think it's quite necessary to have that amount of survivability on the Kohler. I think this amount will be just fine to survive basically anything. Anyways, that's most of the interesting stuff to talk about the Kohler. The last thing to talk about here is the mind support. We have played this build quite a lot in the past. There isn't too much new going on with it. It's mainly something that we're keeping in our back pocket in case our Pathfinder strat with the Ghostbusters is not working. If you're unfamiliar with the build, you just toss a bunch of mines. Mines have a bunch of increased damage taken as well as double damage from high impact mine. Caps out both of those effects and just gives you a metric fuck ton of damage to anything in range of the mine.
coins. Other than that, it's just taking a bunch of minor effect, grabbing some ES. It's also wearing some utility items. It's a pretty simple build. One of the last introductions here is going to be the fast boy. Now this takes a little bit of explaining on what this character is actually doing. This character does two things. It is extremely fast and it is very tanky and it can live on its own without auras. It does those things and that is all it is designed to do. The main function of this character is to take advantage of this particular keystone, which is tormented spirits in your map can possess players for 20 seconds and tormented spirits in your map cannot possess monsters. The idea is that you put 12 or 13, 14 tormented spirits on your map via scarabs and the atlas and various other methods. And what this character does is he goes into the map and he kind of preps it before you clear it. He has a ton of movement speed and he also has permaphasing. So what he can do is sprint through the map at light speed, picking up all of the ghosts and exhausting the 50 nearby monsters possessed per ghost. Once he's touched around the 600 to 700 mobs in the map, you can then do a normal clear. So this character's sole function is to just speed up the process of getting the tormented spirit to infect everything via extremely high movement speed and he needs to be able to do that in a five orb delirium map solo without attacking without leech and this is the character we've come up with it is very similar in structure to a lot of heist runners and that kind of thing except for it can forego all forms of damage and the goal is to make it as tanky as possible so it can sprint through five orb deli map without a care in the world first thing to mention here that is relevant on the new patch is the transcendent spirit the transcendent spirits here ha normally have a pretty nasty downside and that they remove movement speed for how much decks you have in range here however this new jewel can be used with the new tattoos by tattooing the attribute nodes here that are not allocated therefore removing the downside that normally exists on this jewel, giving you more movement speed than you'd have before. And that is one way we are improving the movement speed of this particular character. We're doing this in two places. We have the Transcendent Spirit here and here. Just make sure that you are tattooing off all of the dex nodes that you aren't allocating or else you will be reducing your movement speed here. One other defensive layer it has, of course, being a Pathfinder is a crazy life flask that never runs out. You can scale this on cluster jewels via peak vigor as well as other life flask boosting clusters like Profane Chemistry. Another massive defensive layer here, of course, is Chainbreaker, giving us a ton of rage, which of course is giving us Berserk, which is a massive less damage taken multiplier. Also, of course, is very necessary for movement speed. So a lot of the gear you're gonna see is gonna have a bunch of mana regen so it can sustain the rage. It's running Pet Blood, of course, but it's sitting at full life, which means it actually has a massive EHP pool because the life is constantly being refilled via flash. On top of that, it's running a bunch of defensive ores here. It also has a Blasphemed and Feeble. One last thing to mention here is you can lose a bit of movement speed here to put in the absolutely crazy combo of Blood Notch Immutable Force. This build does not have it because I think it increases the cost a little much. I also, once again, don't think it's super necessary, but if you find this character dying, please consider a Blood Notch Immutable Force. That combo will probably make this character immortal. Not that it's super necessary, but it is a consideration. We we're kind of honestly expecting the aforementioned Blood Notch stun tech to get nerfed on the patch, but seeing the patch and the lack of changes, definitely something you could still pull off on this character, but you're probably gonna have to drop a little bit of movement speed on stuff like the pure talent to make it work all these defensive layers it has all of the recovery all of the movement speed all of the permaphasing it should be the perfect character to sprint through the map and proc all the ghosts and give a bunch of quant one last thing to touch on here is how in the fuck do you level all of these builds and all of these builds fall into one of two categories the first category is this build is impossible to play as a league starter and there is no viable transition path that it can play for example the fast boy how are you supposed to level a movement speed character starting from level one the answer is you can't and so unfortunately the answer is you really have to do a full respec into one of these characters if you want to play a character like this. The second category of character is something you can play on League Start. And for those particular POBs, I have included different trees at different levels and different item sets that you can look at for various uniques you want to get and kind of upgrade paths that you can get to. It should help you give a little bit more guided approach on how you should be transitioning from campaign start to your end game build. As for what the builds that can't level as the intended build, I am going to include these builds down in the description as well. One of them is Ben's Poison Seismic Pathfinder. We just straight up yoinked this POB and slapped two cold iron points and a Mings on it to make it softcore viable. Our Shadow is also going to be playing an Exang Mines Saboteur, but he's also considering going Hexblast Mines as well. 
They're both pretty good options if you want to level the shadow. Those are two really, really good options to consider. As for the Aura, Curse Bot, and the Kohler, all of these people can level with a level one setup starting at the campaign. And so I've included those trees and those item progressions so you can kind of see what these people should be equipping at various stages. And as for the Mana Guardian, he is leveling as an Arma brand slammer. I'm going to link to Jungron's video here. It's a video from last league, but it is still very relevant today. This is a super good build you can play on Templar just to get through the early campaign and then switch to a Mana Guardian around level 90 or so. You could maybe do it a little bit earlier, a little bit later, depending on how fast you get there. There is one last topic here, and that is what should we play if we have a smaller party size? There's a few tips and just general advice if you're trying to assemble a party that is size of like two to four or maybe even five. I think in general, if you're a five man, you can follow most of the advice in most of these builds and it's going to work out the same, except for you're going to be missing the flex support, which is probably going to be the fast boy. If you're in that situation, I would consider maybe having somebody plan to level a second character as a pathfinder, which you can do in just a few hours and then get it boosted in five ways to like level 90. And you can have this character on a character switch and use that extra portal in your map to switch characters after you proc'd all the ghosts. Other than that, your comp is going to be the same, minus the flex support, which is the fast character. If you're in a four man, I would recommend going the following comp, which is a carry, an aura bot, a mana guardian, and then a cola. Now, this goes against previous advice I have given where I'd always recommend the curse bot as a third character. The reason for that is twofold. Curse bots have received a pretty big nerf in power a few leagues ago when they did the curse rework, so it's not as compelling as maybe it once was. Additionally, the introduction of this particular mastery right here, which you've probably seen other people using, which is the inversion mastery, kind of makes it so you can play a setup that absolutely does not need penetration, which is the biggest selling point for a curse bot. If you're in a four man and you're not running a curse bot, what you can do is have all of the defenses from the mana guardian in its purest form, and then also all of the loot that a Kohler provides to you. And you can get around the pen issue by taking this particular mastery alongside a very another strong item, which is Abhorrent Interrogation. Now, Abhorrent Interrogation is a super underrated item, and it is honestly so insane for damage. It, however, has one big drawback, and that is, of course, the ramp. It only has a 25% chance to inflict Withered. However, when the mob is at max Withered, you are doing a ton more elemental damage. Couple that with the increase effective damage you get from the inversion mastery, a lot of setups can come very close to curse bot setups with penetration with just these two things comboed together. This particular duo setup with just five withered stacks instead of 15 is giving us around 87 million spark hit DPS. At max withered stack, which takes a little bit long to get, which is of course 60 hits of spark, you're sitting at 113 million hit DPS, which is honestly quite respectable for a duo. So I think the main appeal of going curse bot as a third or fourth character is honestly kind of gone. And I would start relegating curse bot to be like the fifth party member if you have one. So in a four man, you kind of can pull off all of the same strats that five or six mans are doing. You're just kind of missing a little bit of that player quant, but you're going to have all of the defenses that the mana guardian's providing and all of the quant bonuses that the Kohler can provide in this particular setup. And with the pen issue solved here with the inversion mastery as well as important interrogation, it opens up a lot of, you know, gearing constraints that you had before. And it's something I definitely recommend looking into. This particular duo build, which I'm going to put down in the description, is a trickster. However, you can play it as an assassin. You can play it as an elementalist. And there's also a lot of arguments to still go Inquisitor. And I do believe the top end of Trickster to be more defensive. And so if that's something you value, you can consider Trickster. I, however, am not going to tell you how to level this fucking thing. I have no fucking clue. But you know who can? That's my good friend Haloplasm. If you're new to leveling these kinds of things, you don't really know where to start, I would definitely recommend checking out Haloplasm. He makes good guides on like duo specific setups. And he really does a good job like breaking down like everything you want at every level and like a very clear gear progression. So if you're new to like Aurobot carry type stuff, I definitely give him a shout. Definitely has super good content. Highly recommend. I'll put a link down to his YouTube in the description. Now that we've kind of discussed what we can do in like a six man, a five man, and a four man, I can kind of give you a few suggestions on what you might want to do as a three man. Unfortunately, three man teams are in the middle of being able to duo and do stuff like simulacrums or five ways, and their group might be a little bit too small and priced out of stuff like the super juicing torment and enraged strong boxes that four, five, and six mans can do. 
And so the number one advice I could give to you if you're in a three man is find a fourth person so that you can play mana guardian and color. But hey, if you can't do that, understandable. Your options as a three man are probably to do one of two things. One is to convince your third player to play a traitor instead, because I'm sorry, there's like nothing to do in this game if you're a trio. You're in such an awkward position in terms of what content you can do and what content you can do profitably. You can make an argument that you can go in map and you can MF with like a semi scuffs like MFing with an Orobot and a Mana Guardian or that kind of thing, but it's better off just doing any other permutation of two man or four man. It's a really awkward number to have. If you really want to give three man a good college try, I would run a carry with some modest amount of MF. I would run an Orobot, of course and then a mana guardian so you don't die. You can do enraged box maps, which is kind of like the end game thing to be doing right now. You can also throw on the new and shiny torment stuff, but the unfortunate reality is you're not leveraging the multipliers that are really good in group quant, and you're gonna be kind of dividing the number of loot that you get by three. So just know that while you can do it, it is unfortunately not in an amazing spot at the moment. If you are a duo, you do have tons of options available to you. Simulacrums are extremely popular. You can do five ways. They are not dead despite what Reddit says. They are still going to be the best XP and servicing people in five ways and selling jewels is still going to be one of the top tier duo money makers that you can do in the 322 league. If you're not a fan of acquiring brain damage and you don't want to do the aforementioned five ways or simulacrum and your morals are a little bit dubious, you can invite four people that are just looking to get some a little a crumb of XP and you can invite them to your MFing map and then steal all their items and say that they're leeching. That's a pretty profitable thing to do as well. Well. And then once you're done, you can go on Reddit and talk about how MFing is in a really good spot and you made so much money because you've stolen the item from four other people. But if you don't like brain damage and you have a good moral code, you can MF in enraged box maps. It's just maybe not as good as if you were in a six man. However, I would watch the price of the enraged strongbox sextant closely because that can really decide what your margins are. If that sextant shoots up in price really high, you can consider leveraging ghosts a little bit more and running through more of them per hour than shelling out 20, 30, 40, 50 chaos for the enraged sextant every map you want to run. But yeah, those are pretty much all of your options. That's what you're going to be playing if you're playing in those various group sizes. Anyways, that is a summary of all of the builds that we're going to be playing in the 322 Trial of the Ancestors league it also should be all of the potential builds you can play in various group sizes once again i do have a separate video coming that is going to be explaining all of the potential farming strats that you can do that is an equally long video that has a lot of discussion necessary because they did add a lot of keystones and i do think that the end game farming meta is going to be shaken up a lot as a result of all of those keystones so look out for that one i hope you guys have enjoyed if you do have any questions concerns anything like that I always try and answer as many people as I can in the YouTube comments. You can always hit me up on Discord as well. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. And once again, I'm Snap, and thanks for watching.